King David is a flawed hero. I use those words carefully. He's a hero, but he's very flawed. And what I see with him, and particularly with what I want to share today, is that God has recorded the bitter and the sweet of his life, the good and the bad, <laughs> the successes and the failures, in technical, with no censorship. It's embarrassing. You read it and go, oh no, he's a hero. I don't want to hear that about my heroes. Uh, but it's there. And why has God seen fit to a man who he loved and who the Lord said he's just, he's a man after my own heart. But in his flesh, in his weakness, he's like you and me. In fact, I would argue he probably did stuff that's a lot worse than, than what any of you here have done or I have done. And I think um, the Lord's included it in the story that we learn, learn from our frailties. You can learn from your successes, yeah, but you, you, there's, there's something about learning from your frailties. It's about having a deep respect for the doctrine of the sinfulness of humanity. And it's not just a doctrine out there, or we believe in that man fell. It's actually, I fell. You fell. Uh, we are born in sin, and our natural disposition is to do the wrong thing. I mean, they painted that jolly cupboard that Kathy and I gave to the church, and, and the paint was wafting up to the, to the room. I'm smelling, I'm getting high on the fumes. So, of course, I, my big nose leads, leads me down there, and Milan happens to be down there, and I see it's painted, and you know what comes upon me? I want to touch it. He goes, don't touch it. <laughs> it's just been painted, and, but something perverse within me says, the forbidden. When he's not watching, I'm going to touch it. <laughs> There's something terribly wrong with us as human beings. And until you face that, you're not in a position actually to draw upon the grace and the power and the life of Jesus Christ to not only restore us back to God and to forgive us our many sins, but to empower us to tame this wild beast within. The beast within. You want to hear a good song? Listen to Johnny Cash's The Beast Within. He wrote it and sang it before he died. And it's the best explanation for the doctrine of sin in, in musical style. <laughs> Download us. Very good. But we need Jesus to tame our hearts, which in their natural disposition, without him, will, will choose to do the wrong thing. And so with David, we've got to learn some lessons here from our frailties, and then we can walk in victory. It's not good talking about the victory of Christ and all the benefits that are now ours through him, they're, they're all very true. Unless we have a deep appreciation of the doctrine of sin and our fallibility and our frailties and our natural disposition to do the wrong thing and we need protecting, we need guidance, we need power, radical power. We don't just need to be told what's right and wrong. We need radical power. So becoming a Christian is not about becoming a nice person. It's actually about receiving a new life. So some people view Christian conversion, oh, just, just try and be nice. Well, I'm not naturally nice, neither are you. Naturally, we want to touch the paint. I need a new life source. I need new power. I need, a, I need government over me. I need good government, perfect government that's kind and loving. And as we, we, the songs we sang this morning, God, you're so good. He is so good. I can safely put my life in his hands because he's good and kind and, and I receive his government because I totally trust him in what he asked me to do. Well, King David was a hero and he did this, but he also failed terribly. Um, so this is a pretty dark aspect of his life. It's not a pretty picture. And I'm referring to his adultery with Bathsheba and it's unbelievably tragic consequences. He was forgiven of his sin, but the consequences carried on to several generations. And it's, a, it's, a, it's an incredibly powerful story. So the Holy Spirit ensured that this terrible incident was recorded to warn us of sin's destructive power 
even for those who really love Jesus and who have dedicated their lives to him. And so we're looking at this story to learn, humbly learn from this flawed hero. We don't want to make the same mistakes. And the good news about Jesus is we don't have to. And may the Lord open our eyes today so we can better centre our lives upon Jesus. And we're going to seal this morning with communion together because I think we're going to need to take it after I finish sharing about the ugliness of sin, but the glory of of grace. Um, David's now 50 years old. He's been king for 20 years. He has struggled his whole life. And and, um, you just read the story in 1 1 Samuel. But now he's king. He becomes king of Judah, the southern part, for seven years. And then he becomes king of the, the ten tribes of Israel. And he has distinguished himself as a mighty warrior. And he's wielded Israel into the preeminent power of the Middle East. David seems so strong in our story when we catch it here. Almost invincible. But he comes crashing down in an awful way. Now, why did it happen? Well, you can see it. David's developing vulnerability. And there are three breaches in his life that exposed him to some temptations that were so hard for him to resist. And so temptation doesn't just come and then we go, go, we take it all in. It has to find a a willing heart or or a a broken down mind, a mindset that's a bit twisted or a vulnerability or a hurt. And so it didn't just happen out in a vacuum. You can see what's happening with him. There are breaches in his life. And the first one is that he has given himself over to lust. The insatiable nature of lust is the exact opposite to love. David blindly followed the cultural norms of the Near Eastern monarchs by accumulating heaps of wives and concubines. And concubines are like de facto wives. It says in 2 Samuel 5, 13, after he left Hebron, He took more concubines and wives in Jerusalem and more sons and daughters were born to him. But he was violating God's law. Deuteronomy 17, 17 says he must not take many wives or his heart will be led astray. A clear injunction. Monogamy and not polygamy was and is God's order. That's Genesis 1, 2 and 3. Blind Harry would know the story. Everyone in Israel knew the story. It's Adam and Eve. It's not Adam and Eve and Sue and... Jane and, you know, like, one man with one woman in a loving and respectful relationship for life is and always will be God's ideal. Doesn't matter what culture says, doesn't matter what the law says, this is the scripture says this. And so we we believe that without in any way being hateful to people that violate God's law. We, we, we have sympathy towards them because they need Jesus. They need the Lord in their lives. And there are men and women today, there are, there are quite a few families in Australia where there's multiple partners. There's a lot of polygamous marriages. There's a lot of, of polyamory relationships. They're not legal yet. Who knows in 20, 30 years' time. And so every so often the press will pick it up where there's one man who's got about four women and has produced 20 kids and you as the taxpayer end up covering all the costs of it. But they're not legal, they're illegal. Uh, if they, so it happens in our society. So, so what gets me in this story though, it's interesting, that no one had the guts to confront David about this sin. No one. He needed to be confronted. And people may have rationalised it by saying, oh, well, you know, all the kings do this. Yeah, but not the king of Israel. God is the king and there is the law and he has to submit to it. And somebody else might have said, well, you know, at least he marries them so it's legal. You know, and, and all these women were not married to other men so he's not technically committing adultery. Yeah, but he's got a problem with lust. He can't control himself. He sees a beautiful woman, he wants to marry her. Well, I think, first of all, he sees a beautiful woman, he wants to have sex with her. I think marriage is just a means by which he can outwork his, his lust. They weren't political marriages. They weren't marriages of convenience like Solomon did to build his empire. 
he's got a problem. You know, others might say, oh, it's a private matter, Bill. It's not affecting his public duties, isn't it? Of course it'll affect his public duties. The truth is that David has a problem with sexual impurity. And as his harem grew, so did his lust. He's really got this important area of his life out of control. And the more David indulges his sexual appetite, the more it increases, doesn't decrease. For David, this meant that even a household of women didn't stop his eyes from wandering. Lust by its very nature is insatiable and it can never, ever satisfy. Then you see the subtle deceit of pride. He's got this problem with his sexuality. He hasn't yielded it to God. He hasn't submitted his, his sex drive to God. He hasn't submitted every part of his body to the Lord. It's obvious. He's un, unsanctified, unconsecrated in that area. God, you can have all these areas, but don't have that area of my life. That's mine, thank you. And we do that today. Oh, don't touch that area. <laughs> That's mine. You know, I like this area. And, uh, you, know, ooh, you know, now you're meddling with my life, Lord. Don't touch that area. Well, he wants to meddle with every aspect of our lives, not because he's a meddler, but because he's so good and kind, he wants to take the poison out of our hearts before we cause ourselves damage. There's a subtle deceit of pride here. In 2 Samuel 8, it says, the Lord gave David victory wherever he went. And last week, Pastor Nathan shared about, you know, the songs that were sung about David. He slayed his tens of thousands and Saul only his thousands. But the reality is the, when David became king, the scope of his political and military power grew enormously in the first 20 years of his reign. He basically conquered all his enemies. From the Red Sea in Egypt, through the river Euphrates, right up in northern Iraq, all that belonged to Israel. It was his kingdom. And there were minor kings that would actually pay tribute to him. They were vassal kings to appease him. So he is a power. He has built an empire. He is an amazing military genius. He is in the category of a Julius Caesar and Alexander the Great and Napoleon Bonaparte. I mean, he is, he is a genius in military tactics and uh, no one can defeat him. He is a born warrior. He's a born killer. And, uh, and thankfully, if he wasn't given his heart over to, to God, who knows what other damage he could have done. And so no enemy could withstand him. However, success can be deceptive if we take ourselves too seriously and allow it to swell our heads. It's true. Jesus warns us in Luke 6.26 to be very careful when all people speak well of us. That's why it's doing me the world of good to have my name rubbished in the, in the hand side of parliament. It's good to be attacked. Why? Because it gets you on your knees. It gets you on your knees. And then when you are to fight back, you fight back with love and with a sense of justice, not with a sense of vengeance and payback. And so, uh, so maybe God has sent it my way because I'm getting a swell head. I don't know. I don't lo- I've just had you know, three conferences and every one of the state conferences, I'm getting adulated. I'm getting personal prophecies and people commending me. And I feel like saying, no, no, push it off me. I feel like saying, if you really knew what I was like and the miserableness of my own heart, how sinful I really am, it's only the grace of God that has protected me. But I don't want to hear that. But it's the truth. So sometimes we've got to be careful. And again, last week, uh, uh, Nathan shared a beautiful story of how George Wabnitz has raised his, his children. That when you get commended, don't go, oh, shucks, you know, no, I'd, I, don't, I don't deserve it. It's good to be commended, good to be encouraged. But when you go to prayer, you just say, Jesus, I take that and I give it to you. It's because of you. So there's nothing wrong with being encouraged by people. But if you believe your own publicity, you're in a lot of trouble. We are more vulnerable to the temptation of pride, self-indulgence, and unaccountability when we have it all. And David had it all. And you know, the third thing I see with him is that the danger of idleness. The insatiable nature of lust, the subtle deceit of pride, and the danger of idleness. David felt now he was a cut above everyone. And now he could relax, let his guard down, and indulge himself when others were taking unbelievable risks for the kingdom. And so it says in in 2 Samuel 
11, in the spring at the time when kings go off to war, David sent General Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. They destroyed the Ammonites, another people group that were terribly evil. And he besieged the city with high walls called Rabbah. But David remained in Jerusalem. So he has another rule for himself now. He makes some special allowances. I'm successful. But not for anyone else. He feels like he's had his fair share of wars and the hardships of battle. He reckons he needs a rest from being responsible. I want a rest from being responsible. The burden's too much. And instead of leaning into God, he starts daydreaming. He starts wasting his time, his energy. And this taking a break mentality while others risk their lives for him and his cause is really dropping the ball big time. See, susceptibility to lust, yielding to pride, and the trap of idleness was a dangerous combination, and it primed David for disaster. And and then you can see how the devil entrapped him. It's a classic entrapment by the devil. It's not that the devil caused it, but you see in 2, 2 Samuel 11 how David receives an anointing from hell that takes these natural weaknesses that are unyielded and exacerbates them to a degree and empowers the, potent, the nature of evil in him, the potential for evil, to actually do evil. And we all are in the same boat. It's easy to receive an unwanted passenger into your life who's dark if there is unyielded darkness in our own hearts that we're hiding and covering and rationalising away. And this is what happens to David. And it's not a pretty picture in 2 Samuel 11, the devil's entrapment. So, so initially it starts out with an innocent look. <laughs> One evening, David got up from his bed and walked around on the roof of the palace. From the roof, he saw a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful. There's a song called Walk On By. <laughs> While we're into music. He should have walked on by had a little smile on his face and said, thank you, Lord, for making women beautiful. He could have even said, gee, I like women. And the more beautiful, the better. But I have a beautiful wife at home, and I'm going home there now. And he should have walked away like Joseph did. I mean, there's jolly, what's her name? Potiphar's wife. And some of the images of Potiphar's wife was that she looked like an old hag. I don't think so. I think she was young and beautiful and very enticing. And she's after him, relentless. And you know what he does? He doesn't say, oh, Mrs. Potiphar, let us reason together. (laughs) Let us think this through. Let us debate the issue. The only debating, the debating mechanism he had were his two strong legs that God had given him. And he just took off and went the other way. You can't reason with temptation. You can't reason with it. It'll beat you every time. The devil's a master at it. He's a deceiver. That's his name. Slanderer, deceiver, oppressor. So David, unfortunately, leans into it. Instead of turning his feet and heart away towards his family. And maybe, who knows what was happening. Maybe there was some fights in the harem. You know, women fight. Whose turn is it tonight? He's been with you for three days. I want him. I mean... It will happen like that. I mean, you've got all these women and concubines and they must be scheming and saying, I want him and, you know, it's about time I got pregnant. You know, I want to have a baby too. So it would have been ugly. There would have been a lot of pressure in David's household. Come on, men, having one wife for 40 years, that's enough pressure for any person for life, isn't it? <laughs> Girls, having one husband for I mean, you know what it's like. Honeymoons end really quickly. Real loving, real living, real forgiving begins. You imagine if you got 30 of them. It would be war. So maybe he's, he's like, he's idle. He's saying, man, there's trouble at home. What am I going to do? Who's, whose house, whose room am I going to go in tonight? You know, the kids are upset. And, and maybe he's just, just vulnerable and he's down. And he should be at war. And he sees this beautiful creature and he stops and he lingers. That's his mistake. 
And the innocent look becomes an indulgent gaze. David sends someone to find out about her. He yields. And the man says, hey, she's a married woman. More than that, she's married to one of your hero captains, Uriah. He's one of your best one of your best captains, Captain Uriah, he was a Hittite who converted to Judaism and he loved David and he loved God and he loved the kingdom and he was fighting to preserve the honour of the king. So, so from an innocent look to an undisciplined stare to an indulgent gaze, David loses all awareness of who he is or of the danger that lies ahead. As his out-of-control sexual desire is aroused, all he is thinking about is the present. He forgets about everything else. This is a, the, a really important point. And I want to read a statement by Dietrich Bonhoeffer about forgetfulness. He forgets about everything else. His God, his family, his kingdom. He doesn't say, all of a sudden say, I hate God. I hate my wives, I hate my concubines, I hate my kids. I don't think it's anything to do with hate. Deception is, it's forgetfulness. It's being blinded to the reality of what is. It's actually a fantasy. It's not real. It's make-believe, but it seems real. David's conscience is so seared due to the power of his lust being so strong in his line that he doesn't listen to his servants. They warn him that Bathsheba is married to one of the king's elite warriors. But David is immune to this warning and within a short time, she is standing before him. An adulterous act occurs. Then David sent messages to get her. She came to him and he slept with her. Notice that he slept with her. It doesn't say she slept with him. It doesn't say they embraced and there was love and tenderness and, and, you know, all that stuff. Nothing like that. The writer's very clear. Bordering on a rape. Bordering. I don't think it was rape. But who had all the power in this equation? David. Now, commentators are saying she's a willing participant. Some people paint a picture of Bathsheba but it's very unflattering. You know, because they see she's a bit of a schemer later on when she wants Solomon on the throne, but all women who were married to the kings, they were all scheming. Of course they wanted their sons to, to be the preeminent ones. But um, I think it's unfair. She's a married girl. She's a young girl. She's beautiful. She, that, that's just... And he has all the power. I think he, she's the victim of a predator. And David must bear most of the blame as the authority figure. The power differential was so massive. That's why I'm, I'm, I rejoice over the Me Too movement, if you've been following. I think, good on the girls rising up and saying, we don't want to put up with this junk anymore of terrible stuff that has taken place, you know, and they're scared to say anything because they'll lose their job or they won't get promotions or, or shame and, and that. It's like, I mean, you know, you, you know President Clinton and, and uh, Monica Lewinsky, I mean, Lewinsky would say, she said she initiated the relationship. She was a naughty girl. She said that. She says, I, I enticed him. And he, like an addict, is, you know, he gets followed, doesn't follow his reasoning, he follows something else. And, and that's what takes place. But she's, she's 20, 21 years of age. What does she know? Nothing. He's 50. Where are they? In the Jolly White House. Where does it take place? Next door to the Oval Office. His daughter could have come in. His wife could have come in. It's insanity. Blinded. And then, of course, Clinton, when you read his story of his life of being abused as a child and how he cracked and developed this licentious lifestyle, he calls it a parallel life, he had to get a year's worth of counselling from pastors and psychologists in the White House to deal with this, this life issue of madness, insanity. But now, I, my sympathies are totally with Lewinsky. I think she was only a little kid, just graduated from high school. What does she know? 
She wanted sex with the president. She's stupid, but it's just stupidity. So even somebody that initiated it, the power equation is so different that he has to take the responsibility. So here with David and Bathsheba, I mean, he's got all the power. So this girl yields and she's married and she knows the consequences. I mean, as if she wants to be stoned. She's got a good husband. She grieves deeply over him when he dies. And so there's a lesson here. But you know what? It's just a one-night stand. It's a very brief fling in David's mind. An hour or so of intense, illicit pleasure. But David has abused his power and broken the trust of his family. And there's an unexpected result that occurs. Oh, she gets pregnant. No way. Yep. How many times have I heard the story of a young woman in my office who said, just once I did it and I'm pregnant. I've got a theory why that happened, so I won't talk about it now. She's pregnant. And her husband's not around. So they can't even hide the fact. This night of passion was exciting. There was an adrenaline rush associated with it. I mean, risky behaviour. David's an addict. It's not actually about sex. He's addicted to his own adrenaline rush. He's got, his life is out of control. And, uh, and he tastes the forbidden fruit. But these stolen waters are terribly bitter. And its taste is going to linger for a couple of generations. And then a deceptive idea comes onto David. I mean, look at this. this is, he's, he's prepared the ground. The insatiable nature of lust, pride, idleness. He's prepared the ground. And now, here comes a demon that sows a seed into his head. So David sent his word to Joab, send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent him to David. So he goes, I'll get Uriah back. So deception, so he's actually going to say, I'm going to get him to sleep with his wife. And then, you know, nobody's going to know. They just, when they see him running around, say, man, he looks like David. Oh, I better not say anything. So David should have immediately faced his sin and confessed it to God and to his advisors. That's what he should have done. Instead, he panics and he concocts a cover-up. And the cover-up is where the devil comes in. Because what is a sin now becomes a malicious pattern of evil. And uh, this is the first time we see David trying to sweep sin under the carpet. So Uriah doesn't respond the way David anticipates. He brings him back from the battle. And he doesn't sleep with his wife. (laughs) And the king does not count on the strength of this man's character. And David, the commander-in-chief, is actually rebuked by the integrity of a soldier because this guy Uriah is so committed to God so committed to the nation, so committed to the king you know what he says to himself, he goes I don't know why I'm here and the king just wants to talk to him but how's the battle going he could have got that from the generals and he says well you go home to your wife now and he thinks to himself, he goes man I should be out there with my boys, I'm the captain and, and, and they could be killed and he says to himself, you know how can I Go to my wife. I mean, she's a beautiful looking creature. Yeah, I'd love to have sex with her. If he's been away for a few months, you know what men are like. But he resists that. He says, I can't do it. How can I have pleasure with the wife of my youth when my men are risking their lives out there? I won't. He's probably praying for them, for protection. I mean, he's a really honorable guy, a really fantastic man. So when I get to heaven, if David and Uriah are there, I'll give David a skip, I'll go straight to Uriah. I say, man, you're the hero. Then we'll see David afterwards. <laughs> so David's desperate, right? So he, next, next night he dines Uriah and he plasters him with alcohol. <laughs> he gets him drunk. But even in his drunken state, Uriah exercises more self-control than, than David and he still refuses to go home. So he's as drunk as a skunk, but he's got enough reason to say, no, I ain't going to do it. He probably was slurring his words, I ain't going to do it. Oh, my men are out there. And, and, and like, this is driving David crazy. I mean, you just, you just love this honourable guy. And then 
the real anointing from hell comes upon him. A diabolical action comes. In the morning, David write, writes a letter to Joab, General Joab, and sent it to, sent it, he sent it with Uriah. He sends a letter that Uriah takes to General Joab that is actually saying, kill him. It's an execution order. But it's done in a deceptive, sophisticated way, which requires a heap of, of deception, and it only comes from hell. And he says, put Uriah out the front. He goes, in the thick of the battle, in the thick of the battle, he goes, put him out there, and then just withdraw the troops and keep him and Uriah and his boys were killed that day. It wasn't just Uriah, but some elite troops were killed because of David's deception. He's panic-stricken, and, 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 and the plan escalates to an unimaginable level. It's murder. What a mess David has to clean up. What a mess. Not only has he, does he have to conceal the adultery and the pregnancy, but also the innocent blood in his hands. It's a perfect cover-up. <laughs> When Uriah's wife heard that her husband was dead, she mourned for him, and I think sincerely. She didn't know what David was up to. After the time of mourning was over, David had her brought to his house, and she, and she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. So there's a very quick wedding that takes place. And then there's an early pregnancy, and I reckon the court went, mmm, I wonder. And the baby comes prematurely, and their suspicions are confirmed. The matter is hushed up, and the nation is deceived. David must have sighed with relief, thinking, I got away with it. He didn't. And when you read Psalm 32, Psalm 51, you read what he was going through. His conscience was so stricken, the guilt, the fear, the shame was so strong in him that his body was falling apart. He thought he was going to die. So psychologically, emotionally, physically, he's become a wreck. Because he knows what he's done. And then it took Nathan the prophet. That's another message. How Nathan the prophet confronts him. And it's interesting <laughs> when Nathan tells him a story about the guy who had two little sheep or three or four sheep, whatever it was, and, and the master takes the favourite little sheep and he kills it and eats it. And it breaks the heart of the guy who loved that little sheep. And so Nathan tells the story to David. David and he says, David, David, what should happen to the man who killed the sheep? And David goes, kill him! Cut him into a thousand pieces and vengeance and... Oh, like, what? The reaction was unbelievable because the law said, if you did that, the guy, the offender, should just pay four sheep. Give, give the guy four more little sheep. It was commensurate. So it's interesting. Sometimes the people who are the most vicious towards sin and towards people who do wrong have got bigger issues in their own lives that they're covering up. Because David unleashes this, this vengeful thing, kill the guy. When he, and really he should have said, no, she needs to pay four sheep to him. So David's, in a, David's a mess. And uh, Nathan confronts him and then he repents. Oh, does David repent? That's another message. I could talk about his repentance. His, let me say, his repentance is more notorious than his sin. He never lets it go. I mean, he really, not just because he got caught, but he repents. He is so sorrow, sorrowful for what he has done. He is so contrite before God, before himself. He makes restitution. His heart is broken. And he, and he really, he's a great example of how to receive forgiveness through humility and honesty, genuine repentance. And, and uh, so he, come, he comes good, but the consequences are felt for the next couple of generations. And so what should have David done? Church, what should have he done? What should we do if we have situations like this? Let me say several things before we come around the Lord's table. Firstly, it speaks to us that we've got to devote all aspects of our life to God. And that includes your sex life, your relationships life. There's no area of your life that is to be debarred from Jesus. 
every dimension of your life. The Apostle Paul says, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, because he's so merciful, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. Not a dead one, a living one. Your bodies, not just your mind, not just your soul. 1 Corinthians 6.19, do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you've received from God? You are not your own, you were bought with a price. Therefore, honour God with what? Your body. Every part of your body. So renew your devotion to Jesus uh, uh, every day. That's why the gift of speaking in, in a brand new prayer language that was being ridiculed in the press because I speak in a heavenly prayer language. And when you think about it, would they ridicule the swirling dervishes? Would they ridicule Buddhists and Hindus who sincerely chant? Would they ridicule our indigenous people for the, the serpent creation myths that they believe? Nah. And so they want to attack my personal private prayer language, which is between me and the Lord. Well, they've got another thing coming. To me, that's defamatory. You don't touch a person's religious life, their cultural life. Imagine if she said that about our indigenous community because they have a whole pile of stories. Just because they're not scientifically proven, they're, they're actually believed as a means to explain creation. No reporter would ridicule that. So they're going to ridicule prayer, the people that want to... So to me, speaking in tongues every day, I want to give an apology. I want to, I want to, tell, I want to tell the newspaper, say, hey, this is what speaking in tongues is about. Don't say it's gibberish. This is real. I need to speak in tongues because it brings God up close and personal. It means that, that God's not a million miles away. I need to be talking to him every day, reading his word. To devote all aspects of my life to him, I need to renew my devotion to Jesus every day. I'm saved by grace, but I'm sustained also and kept by his grace. I've got to cling to Jesus in daily dependence, and so do you. It's the only way we can overcome. Secondly, recognize the power of your sinful nature. And I've said enough about that. And it has the power to destroy your life and those that you love. And so the Apostle Paul was very honest about this. He says, so I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law, but I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind, my logic, and making me a prisoner to the law of sin at work within me. It's there. It's real. The Apostle Paul faced it. And so therefore, I've got to recognize it and I've got to make sure I don't empower that. So I don't give the enemy any avenue. I've got to deal with the darkness in me. And thirdly, I've got to establish some very clear boundaries that, that, that keep you out of compromising situations. How and where and with whom does adultery occur? Yeah, you know where it happens? At work or among friends? Almost 100%. Someone doesn't get up and say, well, I think today I'll commit adultery. I wonder who she'll be. <laughs> nah. Pressure at home, difficulties in the marriage, you go to work, it's an unreal situation, everyone looks good, smells good, acts good. Fantasy takes over. There's an emotional attachment with that person, that woman, that man. Or you're in friendships. And so when you go out with friends, he just looks good because he's not so good at home at the moment. It's always among friends. It's always among people you work with. And so that's why we have to have clear boundaries, very clear boundaries. <laughs> it was... didn't ask Kath permission on this one, but there was this guy that wrote to her and said, I want to catch up with you. He was an old flame. He was a Christian. I remember that like 20 years ago, but without Bill being present. Well, when Billy Vasilakis found out, I wanted to fix him up good and proper <laughs> and not the Christian way. <laughs> hey, super spiritualized. I want to catch up for old time's sake. So Kath and I, just, just, we just talked and laughed about it, really. And she, and she wrote back, she said, no, nah, that's not appropriate. Of course it's not appropriate. You don't do that. And idleness. So I try, to the best of my ability, with my time, is that my wife knows where I am and where my staff know where I am at any given time. And I record it in a diary. 
And it's very rare that I'm alone with a woman um, without people around about me. Very, very rare. If it happens and it's unplanned, then I'll let Kath know straight away. I swear I'd just be aware this happened. No, no issue, but it's just like, you just, just build. Does it mean you don't trust yourself? Well, it's not that I don't trust myself in that context if I'm counselling or, or support, but I, I know the boundaries. But if there is a natural affinity and an attraction, and we as pastors have talked about this in the early years, if I'm looking forward to meet this woman to counsel her, that's a bad sign. Then I hand her on to somebody else. And nah, that's not good because I'm looking forward to it. It's not professional. There's a barrier that's crossed. It's like she might be like Kath, just, uh, just connect with her, you know? No, 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 no emotional connection that way. It's got to be professional. I'm there to help that person. And in a context where there's other people around that can be interrupted. So you just build those things around you. Whether you're a medical doctor, whether you're a pastor, whether you're a husband, you're what, whoever, wherever you work, just build those protections around you and talk with your spouse about it. Establish very clear boundaries that keep you out of compromising situations. And Paul says this, he goes, put on Jesus every day. Clothe yourself, boom. Don't go out naked. Clothe yourself with Jesus. In other words, personal relationship. And don't think about how to gratify the desires of your sinful nature, the flesh. Timothy, he says to Timothy, flee the evil desires of youth and pursue righteousness, faith, love and peace. And consider the consequences of sin ahead of time. I tell you, men, you need to see the film Fatal Attraction. Who has seen that? I saw it a few weeks ago with Kath and it scared the living daylights out of me. <laughs> I mean, it's not for kids. It's an adult film, I tell you. It's like, whoa. <laughs> there are consequences. It's an extreme film, but there are consequences to your family, to your children, to, to the people around about you. And uh, consider the consequences. Don't wait until you're tempted to weigh the consequences. Don't get into a debate with it. You will lose every time. And make yourself accountable, fully accountable. That's what the early Christians did. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, doing life together. Hebrews says, let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. We need each other. Encouraging one another. We need each other. Husbands and wives, you need to be talking about these issues. Friends, if you are not married and you are a single, you need to have some really good people around about you that you can talk to. One of the funniest things I saw was, this is a famous one, you can download this one. At Nelson Mandela's funeral, President Obama is there. And he's sitting next to this blonde bombshell. She's a prime minister of some... Scandinavian country. And it was obvious she's flirting. So they've got their, this is the funeral, they've got their, I mean, the president, for goodness sake, he's got these little selfies. And if you could look at Michelle's eye, <laughs> if looks could kill, then the next, the next minute, she's sitting between him and her. And like, she's, she's like, make my day, girl, you keep away from my man. That's what she was saying. And I thought, wow, good on you, girl. So women, protect your men. Men, protect your women. If you're single, you know, find someone to protect you, to help you, to speak into your life. Be accountable. And so even the great Obama, you know, who was a really loving husband and a good dad and uh, no scandal in, in that area, but even him, you know, right in Mandela's funeral, he's letting this bird chat him up when he should be paying attention to the funeral for goodness sake so it just shows you what what it does to you it makes you crazy and his wife was really fantastic i love her i loved her after that i thought she's terrific that's what we need women like that ferocious <laughs> cultivate a really healthy thought life and uh, just be extremely careful on this one and uh, what you allow in will ultimately come out you've got to cultivate your imagination life we all have an imagination life, and it's a wonderful thing. But you can actually, it can be, for, be used for evil, it can be used for good. And you've got to control it and be so careful. In this day and age, there's so many things that can capture your attention. And uh, there, there's, so many, there's so many things that are so interesting. They can get you in. 
that's really interesting. That program's really interesting. But it can get you in. So you just got to control your thoughts and, uh, and focus on what's honourable and pure and good. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this word, the story, how sobering it is, yet how encouraging it is for us to hear, Lord, that even great heroes failed and that you've included their story to help us not to fail that same way, but to learn the lessons and to learn to walk humbly before you. Lord, as we come around your table, we do want to humble ourselves before the cross of Jesus and to realize that we are sinners saved by his grace and grace alone. Even the faith that we exercise is a gift from, from you. Lord, help us to live in forgiveness and to stay close to you and to allow you into every department of our life, every area of our life. Holy Spirit, we welcome you to officiate at this communion time as we do business with you, Heavenly Father. May the Holy Spirit not just convict us, but guide us and lead us and help us as we endeavor to live dedicated lives that honor Jesus and do good to our neighbor. Amen.